Hello and welcome to FACT's webinar called Farrowing on Pasture. Our presenter today is the fantastic Mike Lewis from the National Center for Appropriate Technology, or NCATS. I am Larissa McKenna, FACT's Humane Farming Program Director, and I will be moderating the session. Thank you all for being here and joining us this afternoon. Let me take a minute for a few quick fact introductions before we dive right in. Food Animal Concerns Trust are fact. We are a national nonprofit organization. We're headquartered in Illinois, but we do work with folks from all across the country. Um, the organization works to ensure that all food producing animals are raised in a humane and healthy manner. And we accomplish this by supporting humane farmers such as yourselves on this, on this webinar. Also by promoting policies that make food from animals safe and healthy to eat, and by helping consumers make informed food choices. My colleague Samantha, who you might see on the screen, and I run FACTS Humane Farming Program. Um, and we work with folks like you, livestock and poultry farmers from across the country. We offer grants, scholarships, personalized materials, mentorship um, experience, and of course, webinars on all sorts of topics. Um, I do want to make a note that we are accepting applications for our Fund of Farmer grants through tomorrow, January 20th. So you might want to check that, that opportunity out and any of our other um, services at foodanimalconcernstrust.org forward slash farmer. So at this time, I am just delighted to introduce our guest presenter, Mike Lewis. Mike is a sustainable agriculture specialist with the National Center for Appropriate Technology or NCAT for short. Uh, he, he's a sought after speaker, which we're really lucky to have him here today, who educates audiences on agrarianism, reg uh, regenerative agriculture, farm safety, veterans in agriculture and local econ economies. He's been recognized as a farm aid hero for his work with veterans and sustainable agriculture. So we are just so lucky to have him with us today. Um, he's gonna be sharing his experience and years of expertise um, about farrowing on pasture. So I think without further ado, Mike, I'm gonna hand it over to you to get us started. Take Thank it away. You. Thank you so much. Let me see. I'm thankfully not new to this Zoom thing. So just bear with me. Do, do I? All right, hello everybody. Um, I'm excited to, <clears throat> to be here. I, I really appreciate um, everybody taking the time uh, to be here today. As I, I get older, um, I realize that I value time more and more. So it is meaningful that you chose to spend some of your time with us here today. Um, and I definitely want to acknowledge the folks from uh, FACTS for, for putting this on. I think that um, NCAT's fortunate to, to be able to work so often in, uh, with FACTS on these sort of educational series. So I do want to uh, give a big thank you to them. Um, and uh, as you heard, I'm, I'm Mike and I, I work as a sustainable agriculture specialist with uh, NCAT. Um, but uh, my... Um, technical difficulties. One moment. Okay, my apologies. Um, for some reason, my slide wasn't advancing. Um, again, my family lives and farms uh, the um, western foothills of the Appalachian Mountains in a small town of Livingston, Kentucky. Uh, we're a, a small diversified family farm. Uh, we raise a, a little bit of crops, uh, some livestock, but one of the largest uh, operations on our farm is a fair to finish uh, pastured pork operation. We have uh, been breeding and raising um, pastured pork for about 12 years now. Um, I do want to very quickly um, talk about, I'm, I apologize, I'm having issues advancing my slide within Zoom. Um, so normal. 
stop share for a second. I do again apologize. I'm not certain as to why this will not advance once I open the presentation and share it. Um, may simply for the sake of time, just allow everybody to see it in non-presentation mode if that's acceptable. Um, so I do um, again want to talk a little bit about the National Center for Appropriate Technologies. Um, we've been promoting sustainable living for over 40 years. Um, we were established in 1976 and we're a national nonprofit with a mission of helping people build resilient communities through uh, local and sustainable solutions that reduce poverty, uh, strengthen self-reliance and protect national uh, natural resources. Um, every day, uh, MCAT staff works to help individuals find solutions that will ensure our children and grandchildren inherit a world with cleaner air and water, uh, efficient and renewable energy production and healthy foods uh, grown with sustainable techniques. Um, this slide up here gives you a, a snapshot of several of our programs. So really quickly um, and, and adds the links into them. Our Arm to Farm program is our Veterans in Agriculture Training Program. Uh, Soil for Water is a peer-to-peer -peer, um, farmer education project that's working on educating farmers on how proper soil health can increase uh, your soil's capacity to hold water. And most importantly to us is our ATRA project, which is our sustainable agriculture project. Um, quick uh, overview of uh, what we'll be talking about today. I do want to do a quick uh, history and overview of pigs. Uh, we'll cover a little bit about confinement versus pasture. Um, considerations for your pastures, um, what type of housing you should be looking for if you're going to be farrowing on pasture, um, <clears throat> animal selection, breeding considerations, uh, animal health, and then uh, we will have a brief uh, question and answer after, well, as brief as, as it need be, or as long as it need be, I presume. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about the evolution of the pig, um, mostly because it's it's interesting and my son helped me uh, do a little bit of research. Um, so today's uh, farm pigs actually um, originated from the European wild boar. Uh, the earliest mention that we can find of them in written text is in about 7,000 years um, before the common area was the first notation of them being domesticated. Um, as you can see from this, um, uh, document here, this uh, photo, the domesticated pig has a smaller head in proportion to the body, um, a mostly curled tail, uh, less hair, and a thicker layer of fat um, than, uh, than the wild boar relatives that they descended from. Um, now, it's important to note that the, though the physical characteristics have changed, um, the domesticated pig still has most of the behavioral traits of the wild boar. Um, Two, uh, two fun facts from uh, my research with my son. Um, when DeSoto landed in uh, Tampa, Florida in 1539, he brought with him 13 pigs. And by 1543, the population in, in that area had exploded to over 700 pigs. So one of the benefits or downsides to raising pigs is that they are very prolific. Um, Um, another fun fact, um, Wall Street in Manhattan was actually named after a border built to keep pigs out of certain areas that they deemed they didn't want to have pigs in. Um, so ever since uh, the dawn of man, or the dawn of this country, we've been struggling to keep our pigs in the pasture is, uh, is the takeaway from that. Um, pigs are really intelligent animals. They are highly uh, social, uh, very sociable animals. They like to be together. Um, they're omnivores. They have a, a fairly varied diet, but it is high in fiber. Um, our pigs spend the bulk of their day uh, foraging and rooting for food. Um, as you all know, the pig piles, they will make nests and sleep together uh, in a huddle. Um, they need some warmth. Um, you know, often see them, uh, everybody knows that pigs wallow in the mud. That's, uh, that's for two purposes, really. The first purpose is for cooling. Um, and the second is actually to help uh, with parasites as, uh, and skin care as the pigs are 
um, rolling around in the mud, the, the, the mud and the dirt is actually rubbing off some of the parasites. Uh, so it helps with parasite management. Um, another thing that um, I think is important to note in terms of pasture management is pigs do use a designated bathroom area um, and not the one you want them to. So just be, <laughs> be aware of, of that when you're planting your pasture so you don't end up making mud holes or sinkholes or but it, it seems like in, in our forge system they, they always seem to want to make the area right in front of the gate their designated bathroom area which can make mud holes so you have to be uh, cognizant of that. Um, in terms of um, pigs on pasture versus um, confinement um, today, uh, roughly 90% of the pigs raised in the United States are um, raised in confinement. Uh, most of those are on concrete floors. Um, this is a, a really industrial production system and in truth, something I, I am aware of, but I would not uh, consider myself someone you would call if you had questions about this industrial production system. Um, while it is more efficient and controlled, um, the pigs rarely will see the light of day and have no time or space for foraging or other natural behaviors. Um, common, your common commercial hog operations will have a very high startup cost, um, but they do, uh, in many cases, provide a lot less um, variables and more consistency in terms of a uh, pasture-based system. Um, the uh, the other side of that is that we are seeing an increase, a, a big increase, uh, at least from my work uh, on a daily basis in pigs being raised on pasture, which I, we of course think is good. Um, I do wanna um, maybe talk real quick about some of the benefits of raising pigs on pasture. Um, there are a lot of them, but maybe I'll try to keep it to three. Um, we, um, first and foremost, we feel that, um, Raising our, our pigs on pasture uh, provides our customers with a better quality meat. Um, and I say that in two, two aspects of, of better quality meat, um, both in taste and nutritional content, but also in a community sense. You'll see, I put this um, quote on there from uh, Liberty High Bailey. And uh, I put that quote in there. Uh, it's a book he wrote called This Holy Earth, um, if, if you're interested, if you're a book collector like me. Um, but I put this in here because I think it, it articulates the point that to, to care for the earth and the creatures that share it with us is in fact an act of community. So from my family's perspective, pigs raised on pasture, um, it's better for them, it's better for the planet, and in turn that's better for our community. Um, the second reason uh, that is on our list uh, as a farm is that pigs help manage our land. Um, and they can help improve our soil fertility. Um, in, our, in our system, we use our pigs to help clear and maintain our forests. And sometimes we bring them into our gardens to help with tillage and fertilization. Um, they are, uh, on our farm, they're an important part of our overall production system. And most of the time, uh, if, if y'all raise animals, you understand the most of the time caveat there. Um, most of the time, they actually help us save time and money by doing uh, a lot of our work for us. Um, the final, um, I guess the, the, the third point I'll, I'll say is, is why I think this is important is the pigs get to be pigs. Um, I hear from a lot of farmers in my area that pigs are, you know, they don't want to raise pigs because they're mean and, and ornery and, you know, they can be aggressive. And I would counter that if you're being raised in a scenario like you see on the, on the left in the concrete and you're locked up 24 hours a day, you are gonna be pretty, uh, pretty ornery. So um, pigs get to be pigs, uh, they get exercise. This helps prevent stress, helps prevent other diseases. Um, and if you rotate your pastures properly, keeping pigs on pastures can also really aid in reducing the, the parasite load of your stock, um, thereby reducing your uh, reliance on, um, uh, on uh, dewormers and other, uh, other medications. Um, so I want to move um, quickly into um, pasture considerations. 
Um, I put this, um, when we started on our farm um, with pastured pork, about 90% of our pasture was made up of our fields and our gardens. And we were rotating feeders in and out of those. Um, that's changed considerably uh, for us over the last five years, as you can see from this image. Uh, and I apologize for uh, my lack of technical skills in, in making things flashy, but I hope this is, is, <laughs> is doing the job that I intended it to for you. Um, as you can see, the majority of our pastures are uh, now in the forest. Uh, we do this primarily, um, and, and I guess we can talk about that a little bit when we get into the breeding section, but it's primarily because in uh, two months out of the year, those sections where those paddocks are loaded with uh, hickory nuts, uh, walnuts, and um, numerous different types of oak acorns. Um, so I, I put this in here. I'm going to actually advance to the next slide because I tried to zoom in a little bit. Um, if you see um, if you see the, uh, the small squares, the small red squares attached to those two paddocks, those are actually our, what we call our housing paddocks. Um, those paddocks um, are where the pigs sleep at night. It's where their housing structure is and where we feed and water them. Uh, each of these paddocks uh, varies in size between uh, one and a half to three acres. Um, the only determining factor that we used for the size of the paddocks was our ability to run fence efficiently and, and safely without being on slopes or in runoff ravines. Um, our uh, housing paddocks are actually field fence. Um, the rest of those paddocks that you see out there uh, emerging off those are actually um, three strands of polywire um on a, a mixture of t-posts and wooden posts uh, we find that um, we're able to do a pretty good job managing and maintaining our hogs in the field with um with the three strands of poly um that being said we'll move down here to the farrowing um if i'm assuming you can see my cursor as i move down here to the bottom of this photo you can see a big cedar tree next to a well, that's actually a blueberry orchard but that, that is our farrowing pens um, we actually use pens um, for our farrowing and as soon as our, our our pigs farrow and the piglets are out the piglets are introduced to electric fence it is not a we don't use the six jewels. Uh, we actually use a poultry. We use six jewels in all our primping, um, but in our farrowing pens, we just use a three jewel solar, a 0.3 uh, solar poultry charger. Uh, we don't want to shock them a lot, but we want to teach them early on that that's a barrier that they do not want to pass. And because of that, we feel like we've been very successful. Um, moving um, so. Um, and those, and those pens are separated, and we'll talk about that a little bit when we get into breeding. Our farrowing pens are actually separated. But our pigs, uh, you can find a lot of information um, out there from a lot of different sources on the number of stock per acre. Um, I can tell you that uh, in our experience, we use a, a, a rule that it's between 15 and 30 pigs on an acre, depending um, on your forage and your capacity to rotate, um, right? If you've got a one acre paddock, but it hasn't, you know, something hasn't been in it for a year, you're, you know, you can increase that load. Or if you've planted turnips and beets as we tend to do in some of your paddocks when there was downtime, then you can increase that stock load per acre. Um, we rotate our paddocks, our pigs rotate every three or four days. Um, and that again is depending on how beat up the area that they're in is looking and, and what the forge looks like. It's more of a judgment call, but it is pretty simple for us because as, as you can see, we have these main paddocks that are attached directly to the, um, to the pasture paddocks. The only uh, one that is a pain for us is this one up here at the top where you can see that that almost diamond shaped is segregated and we have to walk up there to, to open that gate and put them in there. So that's a little bit, that's the only path we have. Um, it's also important to make sure you have access to uh, a lot of fresh water, um, especially if you're, if you're farrowing. I, I mean, I, I, I guess not especially, regardless, you need to make sure your animals have water. 
Um, so you have to make sure that you have a strategy to do that, to, to not only get the water, but get sufficient water without making this a lot of work for you as, as a producer. Um, everything that we do on our farm is about increasing the efficiency of our daily activities without compromising the happiness and health of our animals. So you can see my pastures are a long ways away from any water source. Um, but what you can't see in my uh, flashy artwork is that we do have uh, each of these paddocks has a very large, uh, I believe it's a 650 gallon uh, water holding tank. And we have a gas powered pump uh, that comes from a pond in, the, in this bottom pasture behind our barn. And about once a week, depending on where our pigs are, we'll actually, we have a gas cap powered pump right there. We pump water into those tanks and then everything else is automated on gravity feeders so we don't have to fool with that. Um, we, this year we did add solar, uh, solar battery and charger system simply to uh, drop a, uh, a water heater in the tank so that we didn't have freezing issues. Um, and I did say I was open to questions during this. So I'm reading a question right now from Dave that says 15 to 30 pigs per acre in the forest. How has rooting or bark eating impacted the pigs, impacted the forest? Um, you know, we're cleaning out a lot of our forests and, and transitioning in more silvo pasture for our cattle. As long as they have ample forage, we don't find them doing a, a lot of damage to, to the root structures and to the forest. Um, certainly we have been in situations where I've, you know, I've had to leave pigs in a half acre paddock for you know, 10 to 12 days, and then you'll start to see that damage. If there's not fresh stuff for them to root, then they are gonna make a, an effort to do that. But typically speaking, we do not have a, um, have an issue with that. Um, and I'm happy to, if I, you know, caveat to you, I, I, my email address is, is back up at the top. Um, and any questions that I raise, I, I find I, even when I'm talking to myself, I raise more questions than I answer. So don't, don't hesitate to email me any of your questions in the future. Um, we do, um, as I said, my, my family's operation is a fair to finish operation which means that we raise our animals from birth to slaughter. Um, it's, not, it's not extremely common, but again, it is picking up a little more traction, but um, we do it because um, we feel like it gives us the advantage of having complete control over the quantity and quality of the pork we produce. Um, but undoubtedly the most difficult and time consuming um, aspect of the fair to finish operation is the Faro. Um, for the first, um, you know, right when those pigs are born, you, you know, that's when the, the, the really challenging stuff comes into play. Um, for the first three to five days, the piglet is very vulnerable um, to dying, um, whether it be from cold or crushing, uh, infection, or even predators. Um, we have a, a pretty good staff of farm dogs, so we have very minimal predator pressure on our operation. But uh, regardless, a dead piglet is a, a big financial loss for a farmer. So most um, modern farms take the risk out of it by using these indoor, indoor farrowing crates. Um, these crates are, are designed so the thighs really can only stand up and lie down. And therefore, they're less likely to roll over on the piglets. We had that photo up, you know, a few slides back. Um, although these crates are really successful at, at um, preventing piglet deaths, they do have some animal uh, welfare drawbacks. So on our farm, we don't use any of those. But, um, our sows actually will give birth uh, usually in <laughs> their farrowing huts, but occasionally they'll uh, they'll decide not to. Um, in terms of outdoor, there is, uh, I mean, there's a, a myriad of options out there um, on the market. There's some available on the marketplace that you can just buy. Um, we're, we're the type of folks that just build things because we have the capacity and the desire to do so. 
Um, and on our farm, we have two primary types of farrowing huts that we use. Um, the A-frame to the left, um, which actually, this is not the, the best. Um, I wish I had had a more recent photo because one of the things that's happened with our A-frame is we actually uh, jutted out a stud from the A-frame side about eight inches off the bottom and brought that out 12 inches so that we could create a barrier that actually, I mean, the roof in and of itself coming down close to the ground will keep your sow from, what gives those piglets a space to hide. But we found that if we added that little bar in across there and jutted it out eight inches, then that gave them a significant more amount of protection. Um, the other one that we're using now, uh, and I put the link here for the, the plans online, I, I found this online, and this is essentially what we use on our farm. Uh, this, it's just called the E-Hut. Um, and as I said, both of these types work really well. You can see with this E-Hut that it has almost the A-frame. The reason we transition to those is that we're able to move these E-Huts a lot easier than we are the A-frames. So I think it's probably because they're more sturdy. Um, but on our uh, E-Huts, we actually have um, posts on the bottom that act as sort of skis. So if we need to move them, we can. Um, as I said, both of these are great, but we're we're switching over to this E-Hut design as time progresses and as uh, lumber wears out, we need to replace things. Um, and 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 again, that is because the most important aspect of farrowing on pasture is to ensure that your piglets can get into an area that the sow cannot lay on them and crush them. Um, as I said, the, the links are here to that uh, E-Hut. Uh, they're also on the, on the back resources page and I've collected some resources at the end of this presentation. But uh, I would encourage you to use what makes sense for you. Um, and, you know, just, Again, I, I did a search. I hadn't done a search for a long time, but I did a search for farrowing hut plans, and there, there's probably hundreds of web pages that opened up with images that were totally acceptable structures. So, uh, use what works for you and what makes you comfortable is my um, my information there. Uh, my my uh, my recommendation there. You don't you don't have to. Uh, do anything you're not comfortable with. If the A-frame works for you, the A-frame will work for you. If you don't plan on moving your farrowing pens, then the A-frames will be great. Um, another thing um, that <laughs> we learned that we really should have known, uh, really in hindsight, is to, to take into consideration that things or manure, uh, they, they roll downhill. So it's Im really important to make sure that your farrowing huts are placed as level as possible to keep things from sliding, uh, so to speak. Um, if you recall the, the image of our paddocks, um, which I can just back up um, right quick. And these are the, the three blue lines down here at the bottom. Those paddocks um, are separated. Um, the reason those are separated, uh, we keep our sows separate uh, for the first 30 days after they farrowed. Um, and this is, um, this is because we learned over time that privacy for the mothers at that point in time was pretty important. Um, sows like to farrow, or at least we found that our sows like to farrow in a secluded private place where other pigs won't bother them or their piglets. Um, therefore, we separated our farrowing pen so that every sow has her own space and there are no territorial disputes. Um, I will also say most of the other farmers that I know and work with um, don't go to this extent and they find that it works just great for them if they just have adequate space. You know, don't, don't stack your farrowing pen side by side is the, um, just so there's a little bit of space, but um, just, um, to add, we've never had a, a, a casualty on our farm due to overcrowding, but we've definitely seen um, a, a significant difference in their temperament and their attitudes when they don't have enough space at that point in their life. Um, I think that's lately has been true with my children as well. The more space they have access to to get away from each other, the better. Um, so just ensure that there's, there's enough space and don't crowd them. Again, we've never had an animal die, but we've had 
we've had some uh, disagreements in the pastures that we didn't didn't really feel like we wanted to have again, which is the reason that we separated them. Um, breed selection. Um, I'm, I apologize. I'll take a look back at those. I'm not going to take a look back at those questions. That'll be way too distracting for me. I apologize. <laughs> We'll get back to those later. Um, one of the most dreaded questions that I, I get um, about our pigs is what breed do you raise? And my answer is always, I don't know. Um, I can't be 100% certain at this point in time. Um, and that's primarily because we don't raise or breed a, a, a specific breed of pigs, but instead we're breeding for characteristics, you know, uh, how they're performing on pasture, how uh, um, meat is marbling, what's the temperament of the animal. Um, you know, other two big important factors is do they, do they respect the electric fence lines? Um, that's, that can be a huge problem. And we, you know, we, we will uh, undoubtedly send away about 20% of our, our ferret hog, uh, hogs as feeder pigs uh, feral pigs as feeder pigs just simply because they don't respect electric and I'm I you know we can easily replace those with an Amish farmer or sell those to someone else that doesn't have that concern for us um, and and the, the last thing that we're breeding for is um, well it's, it's the same thing temperament but you know I have small children and well they're getting bigger but you know am I comfortable with my 11 year old son walking into a, a paddock of pigs knowing that they have that right temperament. So um, one of the first lessons, though, that we learned when breeding is that a good sow is, is critical. Um, and to give you sort of a, a, a definition of what I mean by a good sow, um, and, and you, this takes a lot of monitoring, too, I will add. I mean, a good sow must be calm and careful when she's in general, but specifically when they lie down, you know, I don't know if any of you raise pigs, but some pigs will just plop down. Others will carefully lay down and pay attention. And that's a, that's a good indication that you're going to have a, a good mother. Um, she, she's got to have good instincts and, and be able to make a comfortable nest for herself and her piglets. Um, and then another thing, you know, she's got to be protective of her litter, but not me. Um, and that's that's a good distinction, right? Protect those pigs, but don't attack me when I come in the the, the farrowing pen. You know, um, she needs to have ample um, number of nipples uh, to produce a good amount of milk. Um, you want to have, and, and you want to have healthy and good genetics to pass on to. Um, um, one of the things that you know, I can't express enough, and you'll probably hear me say it like nine more times throughout this presentation, is that for us to do this and to make these determinations, it requires us to know our animals well and spend a good amount of time with them to understand if they're going to be a good fit on our, our system, because it's important that everybody gets along, right? Um, regarding... Um, questions around breed selection we've been breeding and selecting for several years now but um i can tell you that our primary stock um comes from uh old spots large blacks durox and uh, mangalistas occasionally we'll we'll throw something else in there as as a try but those are sort of the the breeds that have led us to where we are today um there's a lot of options out there for pastured pigs. Um, so I would say a little research goes a, a long way. Uh, I don't think that I'm a norm in the fact that I just have pigs that we've bred for our farm. Um, so there are a lot of people out there that work with specific breeds that can answer a lot of questions for you. And I'm happy if you have questions about a specific breed to try and connect you with a, with a breeder from somewhere in your area or around the country. Um, if I was making a recommendation today to a farmer that was just getting started, I think that my initial um, my initial thought process would be for uh, 
that farmer to look more to the Iowa pasture pig or the coon coon as, or coonie coon, however they say that, as they have been specifically bred for pasture and they are a lot more docile and a lot less destructive than, than other breeds. Um, the Mangalistas over here, the little hairy pigs to the right are a destructive force. So if you're not able to keep those contained, they will do a lot of damage in a very short amount of time. Um, I did take a minute to compile a list of um, breeds that I'm familiar with. And again, most of these probably have spare genetics in our, um, in our hog system, but the large black is a good option that has a, a hog with a really nice quality marbled meat. Um, Red Waddle, Tamworth, uh, Duroc. I'm a, obviously a, a big fan of the old spot. Um, guinea hogs are another good option, um, as well as Hampshire's. The thing to, um, the thing to remember is all of these are heritage breeds um, that I've put here on this list, minus the, the Iowa the number four and five, the Iowa pasture and the coon coon. And those have been specifically bred for this purpose, but these animals are not going to gain weight and get to market as fast as a confinement pig that is uh, force fed, you know, the uh, force fed to get there. So um, do be cognizant. It takes us uh, from fair to finish between seven to nine months. Um, and that uh, depends on the, the forage that we have available, also a little bit on the genetics side of things. But I would, as a good rule of thumb, plan on uh, nine months for that. Um, so we'll move on to breeding um, and when to breed. Um, this is a, I mean, this is a huge consideration. Um, I'll say a sow's um, gestation period is 115 days from um, insemination, or as, as we like to say, three months, three weeks, three days, three hours, and three minutes. These guys um, are, are like clockwork on our farm. Um, I've, I've added a link here, um, and it's also in the back. Um, I don't uh, have any affiliation with this website, but it's a it's just gestationperiod.com, and it has calculator that you put in the date that you bred your sow, and it will spit out the date that you will begin farrowing. Um, typically, we move our sows into the farrowing paddocks five or six days before um, before that date. Um, while a sow can produce uh, up to three liters a year, most pastured producers breed twice a year. Um, in my experience, it's best not to push it um, for that third breeding. Um, the sows have time to rest, can help reduce stress and keep your animals healthier and happier. Um, on a, I will say on our farm now, we have in the last two seasons gone down to farrowing once a year. Um, this was implemented primarily we had an abundance of acorn, hickory nuts, and black walnuts available for forage from August to November, so we can significantly offset our feed costs and produce a higher quality, more marketable meat product. Um, we typically raise between 40 and 60 hogs per season, and prior to our transition uh, to once a year, we would breed two or three sows twice a year, but now we breed four sows at the end of November. So when their food intake is increasing significantly, there's a lot of nuts and stuff for them to forage. Um, this helps us keep our feed costs down. Um, but it, again, I have the caveat that every system is different. Uh, every farm is different and that our system of, of once a year may not be the norm. As I said, most of the producers I know will breed twice a year. Um, three big things to consider when, when to time your breeding. Um, the first is how much pasture do you have and, and what is the, the quality of the forage in it, right? I mean, you don't, uh, you don't wanna be overusing your pastures and you also don't wanna be breeding pigs when you don't have access to good forage for them for the duration of their, um, their lifespan because you're, 
you're going to be causing a lot of damage. You'll see some of those tree root damage that we were talking about um, a, a few minutes back with that question. Um, how much time do you have to contribute to this? You know, as I said, the farrowing is, you know, that's 10 days where we're, you know, we're, the, we're in the paddocks three times a day. Do you have the time to do that? You know, is one time a year better for you or two? Um, and then the biggest thing is what's the weather like? Uh, this is my third point. You don't want to be scrambling to try and keep litters warm and dry if, if you're not set up for it. Um, and quite frankly, we were set up for it and we could do it. And if it happened accidentally, we could farrow over the winter, but we don't like to do it um, because it, it's more time and energy. Um, so you, you have to take into consideration your local weather considerations and make sure you have time your breeding so that you farrow at the most opportune, easiest time for you to keep your piglets warm. Uh, for us in Kentucky, um, I can tell you that's early spring and early fall. Um, and then I have, um, the again, the link to the gestation period is there. Um, and I know that I talked a little bit about uh, privacy being important, but, um, uh, Many farmers that I, I I work with farrow, as I said, they don't they don't segregate their farrowing pastures like I do. They just separate their farrowing huts by you know thirty to fifty feet, and that allows them to self segregate without the forced segregation. Part of the reason that we use those farrowing pens individually is it also, as I said earlier, allows us to introduce the piglets at a very early age to our electric fence system, and then we'll keep them uh, respecting that line. Um, so you've done your breeding, we wanna get ready to prep our farrowing space. Um, it's important, uh, the first thing is like install clean and dry litter in the farrowing hut. Um, before you move the sows into there, uh, we do what, um, I'd say modified Swedish deep bedding, just because it's a Swedish deep bedding refers to an entire system, but we do that, which is basically means we just pack a bunch of deep straw into there. And typically we'll insert, uh, depending on the size of the farrowing hut and the size of the sow, we will uh, put two or three bales of deep straw into the, the farrowing hut. Um, Typically, um, we add um, additional bales every couple of days, depending on how compressed or dispersed the bedding has become due to the, the litter activity. Um, this goes without saying to, um, prior to adding the, the straw, make sure your ground is dry. You know, don't lock something up under there that they're gonna dig up later and is gonna create health problems. Um, if you need to add um, heat lamps, um, due to weather, just make sure that they're working properly. We always add, we learned this the hard way years ago, always add a new bulb before you put it in because you never know. Um, it's, a, it's a small investment that reaps huge rewards. Um, and then ensure that you have your, uh, we like to make sure we check the temperature under the lights. So um, ensure that you have uh, the lamp height set so that the heat right under it is around 95 degrees um, Fahrenheit. Um, and, th and that's on the surface of the space where the, the piglets will bed down. And you can, you know, it's pretty easy to use a simple thermometer to do that. Um, second, in terms of preparation is check in with your sow and, and see how she's doing <laughs> um, and ask her if she's ready to farrow. Um, you know, again, we, um, we don't do a, a a lot of checking just because it's sort of calendar based for us. We know when we move the bore in, we know when we move the bore out. So we know within a few days, um, but guarantee she's um, in the correct condition to, to be, um, to be uh, ready to, to farrow. Um, now typically I think that's like uh, around 18 to 19 millimeters um, in, in terms of dilation. Um, if you are vaccinating, Make sure that um, make sure that you you're, you've done it according to your sow's your farm sow vaccination uh, schedule, um, and then um, make sure that you increase 
Um, it's important to increase their feed. Uh, we increase our feed about six days before they, uh, five or six days before we're expecting them to farrow, we will increase their feed to four to six pounds per day. Um, the, the variance in the four to six pounds is, is determined by the size of the sow. Um, and after you've moved the, the sows in there, um, you just monitor them daily. I mean, I can't say that enough. Walk with them, see how they're doing. Um, then, uh, let's see, uh, monitor, monitor, monitor. Um, after you've moved your sow into the actual, I mean, if you're moving her, some, you know, some farmers I know just have them, they don't move them into a farrowing pen, but once they're ready for farrow and you have their paddocks ready, that's when you really have to start being attentive to evaluate the sow um, and ultimately the piglets, um, at least daily. Um, on our farm, the first couple of days, we're out um, in the farrowing pens at least three times a day. And gradually that reduces to once a day as we feel more comfortable with the um, situation. Um, I just want to make sure I've got a note here to mention that it's important to ensure that the ambient temperature in your hut is between 70 and 75 degrees. Um, one of the big things um, uh, when, you're, when you're evaluating your piglets in the hut is that make sure that they're laid out evenly and they're not piled up. Um, if they're piled up, you may need to find a way to increase the warmth of your hut. Um, and, uh, and, and when you're watching and listening to them, pay attention to the noises they're making. You can tell a lot um, about their health and wellness just by observing their daily activities and how they, um, how they interact with each other on a daily basis. Um, so I think I skipped a slide. I apologize. We'll just keep rolling with it. Um, and then uh, the fourth thing is uh, to work. Um, it's important to work to reduce stillbirths. And in all honesty, we do not have a huge problem with this on our farm. Um, and so therefore, uh, what I'm going to uh, share with you is more knowledge that's been passed on to me than what I have a lot of firsthand experience with. Um, but I felt it was an important thing to address for some of you who may be newer to farrowing pigs or introducing new pigs into a farrowing system. And I think the first, uh, what I'd like to do is just sort of give you an overview of some of the factors, the leading factors that, that can increase stillbirths. Um, the first being high parity. Um, and again, we've, we've talked about how we eliminate that on our farm by not overbreeding and not trying to push the breeding cycle. If the sow doesn't receive proper rest between gilts, this can impact the live birth weight of piglets. So as I said, we, we don't exceed two litters per year. Um, in the past two years, we've only once had more than um, one litter a year. And that was by accident, well, not by accident. I'm pretty sure the boar intended to do what he did, but by accident on us, by not, uh, not recognizing what was happening. Um, over conditioning is, is important to stillbirths as well. Um, too much fat and weight can lead to problems during pregnancy and birth. So maintain, make sure your pigs maintain a balanced diet, um, not just during their pregnancy, but before and after. And, and doing that is gonna go a long way towards ensuring healthy litters. Um, Another um, big concern, again, not something I have experience with, but the misuse of oxytocin. Um, again, I, I, I don't have a lot of experience in it, but I know that a lot of people use that hormone to increase reproductive activities. Um, so make sure you're not overusing that. Um, and the last thing is, you know, if sows can have a history of stillbirth. And if, if you have a sow, um, we haven't had a sow with stillbirths for three or four years. Um, as soon as a sow has a stillbirth, we feel that it or has any trouble with the failing process, or um, you know, it's it's time to intervene and, and assist. Um, and then you know that sow moves off our operation because it's you know we don't want to keep breeding that history into our our system. 
Um, it's important to remember, I mean, any, I mean, I, I hate to put it in economic terms, but, you know, farming is an economic activity or, uh, and, and eating is the agricultural act, according to, to Wendell Berry. But um, it's important to remember that those losses are going to impact your profitability. Um, so piglet health, um, it's important to remember that um, all piglets are born wet and cold. So if you are present um, at the time of birth, um, it, it does help to, to quickly dry them off and warm them up. Um, you want to make sure that they get to you a warm spot in the hut pretty quickly. You know, don't um, you don't want to do a, a lot of aggressive movements, but um, you know, get them under the light. Uh, ensure that they're getting to the to the heat quickly. Um, all pigs um, need colostrum. Um, that's where they're going to get their iron and all kinds of other essential. Uh, vitamins and minerals and antibodies. So make sure your piglets get nursing as soon as possible as colostrum will, as I said, provide them with warmth, uh, antibodies and energy. Um, we actually, what we do on our farm is we actually mark um, the heads of the piglets that we've nursed with a marker. Um, that way we make sure that everyone gets a good drink after birth. Um, we do uh, on on larger litters. We do split suckle litters um, to make sure all of the piglets get off to a good start. Um, we typically um, <laughs> typically that would happen in like a plastic tote if we're not able to to segregate them easily. Um, and then we use um, different colored markers to identify the split. Um, and. Uh, I did at the end of my presentation, I provided a link that um, will give you some more information on this um, process. Um, another important thing is don't, um, you know, don't move them around a lot if you can help it. Um, don't disrupt the litter unless it's necessary. Um, it's a, this disruptions can lead to increase the, the occurrences of layons. Um, but that being said, it is important to recognize that it may be necessary to divide a litter um, if the numbers are deemed too high for the sow. But if you must do it, keep it to a minimal and non-invasive as you can. Um, I don't know if number six is a <laughs> an, an industry educational point, but this is a, a point for us is not to ignore the fallbacks. Um, you know, Make sure that they get the care they need as they can still grow into really productive pigs for your operation. Uh, two of my best sows on my farm are uh, fallbacks. So don't ignore them just because they got born a little small and they seem like a runt doesn't necessarily mean that they're not gonna turn into a productive animal for you. Um, and number seven, um, Monitor daily. Again, um, give the piglets attention every day. Um, this helps not only with identifying problems, but also um, it helps the, get the piglets used to you, right? I mean, friendly, well-adjusted piglets grow into productive and happy stock. And I can tell you because of the little bit of extra time that we spend in our pastures, I, you know, two benefits from that. I get uh, quality time with my children during those monitoring sessions. But then secondarily, our pigs, when they get out, they come to find us, right? They're not running off and taking away. They're part of the family and they associate with us. So they're trying to find their way back to us when they get out, not get away from us. So monitor and spending time is the, I think a critical aspect of this. Um, uh, some considerations for your sows. Um, again, monitor daily. Check her out. Is she eating? Is she eating enough? Um, one thing that we do is we empty out our cleaners daily and, and provide fresh feed. Um, we clean them out just to make sure that there's nothing in there that could grow into a bacteria or something harmful. Um, so we, we do empty and clean the feeders daily when they are farrowing. Um, ensure that they have plenty of clean water and, you know, make sure they know where it is because we've had that problem before. You know, make sure your sow knows where 
the water is at. Um, it's important to monitor her manure um, and ensure that she is passing it through her system. Um, and, and over just check her udders and make sure that they're functioning properly. Um, one of the things that we do almost immediately after, after farrowing is we try to get the sow out for a walk. Um, you know, walking should cause her to go to the bathroom, uh, urinate, defecate, as well as it will increase her appetite. Um, the next. Hey, Mike. Yes, ma'am. Uh Mike, this is Samantha. I just wanted to say that we've had a couple of questions that probably are related to what you've just said on that slide about um, about uh, feed amounts. Um, I think the question was, um, how much do you feed your sows uh, prior to them getting bred or prior to them getting sort of in late gestation? And then another question about acorns and um, do you recommend acorns and what percentage of their diet should be acorns and nuts? Okay, I am, <laughs> I'm trying to see the questions and I'm not seeing them, um, but uh, dang. That's okay, that's basically what I just said is what those questions were. One, uh, one of them is, um what do we feed a sow per day usually um if she's not pregnant we're usually a pound and a half to two pounds um but again i don't know that i'm the you know i think that the average is about three pounds we're a little less because they have a lot of forage um so um they do that in terms of the acorns we do um you know i recommend acorns um you know, it's a great source of protein for your pigs, right? Um, that being said, if you don't have them falling off trees, it's kind of hard to access acorns. Um, and I wish I could see that question, so I make sure that I'm getting it 100%. If you, if you scroll up, it's the fourth question down. It's from Dave. Oh, you can see my screens. Oh, this is my first time on Zoom. I said that now. Did you go to the Q&A? If you go to the Q&A at the bottom. At the bottom. So when you're, when you're sharing your screen, it might actually be at the top. Um, oh, okay. Oh. It gets covered up by, yeah. Yeah, if you just put your cursor. Oh, okay, I got you. Dave, um, when on acorns, what percentage of their diet is acorns and nuts? Um, <clears throat> that, that. percentage we use because they're foraging for them we're not introducing them so I think that that's uh you know when we talk about that fat getting soft I think that's more with an animal that does pigs. oh I'll back up <laughs> um so um just to cover some of the most common diseases um, that, that, and, and challenges that you'll face with health. Um, the first, the, the coccidiosis is pretty common in suckling pigs. Um, and that's, it's caused by three different types of coccidia um, intracellular parasites. Um, the most telltale symptom of this disease in a pig is diarrhea. Um, often it's just like in chickens, this, is a, this happens with chickens too. Um, it, it, your stool will be bloody. Um, it occurs commonly around 10 to 20 days of age, but it can appear um, up to 15 weeks of age. And usually um, you can treat this with uh, fluids and uh, some, some coccidi stats. Um, however, um, since it often damages the walls of the intestines, it can become a, uh, a chronic issue um, and, and, you know, infections can continue to occur. So that's something you really want to keep an eye out for. Um, respiratory diseases, um, it's not just confined to piglets, but piglets um, that have been just weaned are the most likely to show um, problems. Um, and as with humans, the, the signs are the same, uh, you know, signs of infection are about the same sneezing, coughing, lethargic behavior, difficulty breathing, and slow growth. Um, to prevent respiratory, uh, some of these can be fatal, but, um, you know, the best way to prevent that is, is proper ventilation. Um, 
swine dysentery is uh, not as common for um, for pigs raised on pasture, but it's more um, definitely more susceptible to hogs raised in confinement. So it is important. Uh, I put that on there just to highlight that if you are introducing another hog from another operation, it is important to recognize the signs and segregate any new hogs before you, you bring them onto your farm. Um, mastitis is not, um, not pig exclusive. Uh, it's a health problem in all animals, but it's, um, it's present in breeding sows who are um, actively nursing or have just recently weaned. Um, and it causes reduced milk production, um, loss of appetite, some of the things you look for, uh, high body temperature, um, and it can, it's, it's actually a bacterial infection in the mammary You might notice some skin discoloration if there is an issue. Um, most times this is treated with uh, antibiotics or anti-inflammatory medicines, but some veteran veterinarians will uh, combine oxytocin and cortisol steroids to, uh, to heal the area and bring down any swelling. Um, Again, improving the hygiene of the, area, of, of the area where the pigs will go in, in a long way towards uh, helping with that. Um, greasy pig disease um, is also known as, <laughs> it's just a dermatitis that's caused by um, an inf a bacterial infection and it usually appears as like dark lesions on the skin. Um, it can later become flaky. Um, usually treatable with skin salves, but because this does uh, manifest in young piglets prior to weaning. Um, if, if you're concerned with this, one of the things that you can do is perform a teat uh, dip uh, both pre and post uh, farrowing. Um, uh, anemia is a, a loss of blood. This can happen as a result of the hemorrhage during farrowing. Um, also uh, dietary issues, you know, not enough iron. Um, and in commercial operations, um, they will typically inject 150 to 200 milligrams of iron within a week of birth um, and then administrate iron shots as needed. But um, again, we're, our animals are outdoors and we don't, uh, we don't see a lot of challenges with that. Um, that's everything I have prepared. So I'm on to questions and resources and I can stop my share, stop share, and I will turn on my video. I'm happy to answer some questions. I hope that was helpful and I didn't raise more questions than I answered, which is usually what happens when I talk to myself. So. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mike. No, I think this is a great start. There were a ton of questions that came in and unfortunately, I think you and Samantha might be the only ones that can view them because my internet went out momentarily. So everything got erased on my end. So I apologize um, for that little fluke. We all have those things <laughs> <laughs> apparently happened to everyone. <laughs> but um, uh, so the Q&A will probably be on the bottom of your screen now um, and there's the, yeah, there should be a bunch of them. Let me actually, while you're reading through those, Mike, let me take this poll. I have a poll for folks before um, we, you know, we get any further. Let me just launch it and just give us some uh, some feedback so far of this session, if you wouldn't mind. Um, and Mike is looking through the questions, and we'll we'll be able to answer, take take another ten minutes or so for for questions. Um, well, I can just start at the top. What is the low temperature like in your area? <laughs> right now it's really low <laughs> um but uh how is the heater working for you we don't um you know S S sarah's question we don't um we don't really use heaters um because we we make sure that we time our um time our farrowing uh, you know our birth so that we we know that it's going to be warm um so i um i you know, lows down here. I mean, this this week we're going to be uh, at six degrees this coming weekend for a couple of days. Um, but we we tend to we we decided early on that we didn't want to keep using heat lamps and heaters, so we just made sure that we were introducing um, the the bores at a time that that gave us that. 
Um, and I guess I'll just move right down through these if that's all right. Um, mm -hmm. What uh, what piglet mortality rate do you have? What do you think is acceptable? Uh, I think uh, nothing is acceptable, but <laughs> I have small children that get heartbroken <laughs> when something like that happens. Um, you know, I I think acceptable. I would I would call three to five percent. Um, I would be upset if I got up to that level, but um, you know, I think uh, industry wide, I think eight to ten percent is probably a, a a pretty good rate. But we we think you know with the systems that we're using and the way we raise them, we you know I, I don't like to lose pigs, and we'll go to extreme extent to save them. Um, Carly asked, do you keep the farm dogs in the pens with the hogs? Um, that's, you know, that's kind of up to the dogs, um, <laughs> if I'm being honest. Um, sometimes the dogs will go in and sometimes they won't. Um, but they're, they're certainly comfortable in, in there, um, in, that, uh, in that pen um, with the pigs. And the pigs are mostly comfortable with them. Uh, one of our smaller dogs likes to get in there and play with them, which we have to watch that. But um, the dogs are free to go in or out as they please. Um, and they, they're able to jump the, the three-strand electric pretty easily. Um, how do you manage? Actually, Mike, um, yeah. Sarah had a follow-up question about the uh, about the heaters. She was actually the so talking about the solar water heater. Oh. Uh, not the... Um, not that, and that's what the, I guess that's the hard part when people are asking questions on the slides and we don't know what slides they are. So when you wait, leave for the questions till the end, that's sort of what happens. So sorry about that, Sarah. Okay. Um, I meant the solar hot water here. Uh, so the original question was how do I find the heater? No, the, um, the original question was um, let me find it for you. What is the load temperature like in your area? How is the water heater or how is the heater working for you? I am in Minnesota. And she was talking about the water heaters, not um, putting heat lamps on her piglets. Okay, I do apologize. I got in Sorry, and out. So, um, it, it works 90% um, of the time, Sarah. Um, you know, and 10% of the time I'm, I'm pretty upset. Uh, we are... Uh, we are in the process. I've just ordered some uh, outside electric line about 1,500 feet, so we're able to to run electric up there full time. Um, I I believe that the solar would work great if I was willing to cut down a, a walnut and a tulip poplar tree, um, but uh, I I decided against that and decided to um, uh, to just order electric line, and I hope that that answers that and um if 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 not then please just uh shoot me an email um and then uh what outside temperature warrants the heat lamp yeah increase of fire good point parker um <laughs> that is a very good point um i i would say that you know when we pharaoh we're typically at 55 to to 60 degrees uh, some nights that we'll get down to um into the 30s, but we don't currently have um, heat lamps. If we, if we need a heat lamp for our um, sows and piglets, we typically will move them into the barn for a night or two. Um, so you are, uh, that, that's a great point. Um, I, I'm, I live in a part of the country where we've got so much water that we can't get anything to burn. So um, that's a very good point. So, I mean, the, in terms of alternatives for heat, you know, well insulated, if, if you're set on uh, fairing when it is colder, uh, you know, beef up the insulation in your um, in your farrowing hut. Um, you know, we have one farrowing hut that we, we do uh, haul out if it is going to be really cold. Um, we haven't hauled it out. Um, and that is insulated, and that insulation probably increases the, the ambient temperature in the hut by about 16 degrees. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we don't use our heat lamps in our farrowing huts, and that's mostly because of the, the, the breeding cycle. Um, Kate asks, I pasture raise my pigs in family groups on single pasture, silva pasture. Well, <laughs> That's awesome. I, I, I love silver pasture. I have not experienced issues with 
pigs damaging my trees. My biggest struggle is have been birth to butcher time for clients. There seems to be less of a guarantee on projected growth. Um, I would, I mean, I would pose back a question uh, to you, I guess, um, and I know you can't answer me, but um, I guess what type of hogs are you breeding that you're not able to project your, your growth rate out within a, a, a 15 to 30 day window? Um, or is the the client more demanding than than that? Um, uh, that's probably one of the best uh, to shoot me an email on Kate, and I'm happy to talk th through that with you because um, that your question raises about five questions for me. So, so Kate um, just wrote back in the chat. She says large black crosses. Okay. Um, your large black crosses are, are are you about nine to I mean nine to ten months. Um, yeah, I again I I think it's probably um, probably better if we connect outside of this just because I I probably could ask six or seven other questions. What are you foraging them on? Um, are you able to increase your feed? to um you know because sometimes it's it's that simple just increasing your feed by 10 percent could increase your um your harvest date by a, a significant amount of uh, of time um Mike, but, so i'll go ahead and share your email with kate so she can get up with you later okay great yeah <laughs> um yeah so uh ann hankins asks how big of a concern is disease transmission from a larger confinements within two miles um i would be concerned <laughs> um but i you know it's probably um a, a couple questions i would ask um back to you anna is um what's the terrain like you know two miles distance if we're in iowa is is a, a big concern two miles distance if we're in um Eastern Kentucky, where I live, there's probably 25 mountaintops or hollers in between us. So um, if you're on flatland, I would have some concerns and probably think about what I was doing to um, uh, flat. Yeah, um, I would. I mean, that would concern me, um, you know, but I don't know what your feelings are on um, vaccinations and medications we don't use them on our operation unless we absolutely have to it means we're going to lose an animal if we don't but i would i would definitely um <clears throat> definitely have cause for concern i wouldn't say don't raise pigs but you're, you're gonna have to be a lot more attentive and, and pay attention to what's going on and watch for early signs of diseases um let's see how does the reintroduction of the sows go? Any tricks? You know, <laughs> April, <laughs> I'm really spoiled because most of our sows we've raised from um, from a baby and, and they are, um, you know, for all intents and purposes, they think in, intent and purpose, they think they're dogs. Um, so never had a big problem with, with reintroduction. Um, and I don't, um, I don't have any tricks for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I wish I was better at that one. We've had issues with this uh, Ryan message. We've had issues with this when integrating into holding groups. There's something sometimes significant fighting. Um, yeah, I mean, our sows, like on average, our sows will stay on our farm for three to five years. Um, so it's not like we're introducing a lot of outside stock. The only time we introduce an outside pig is, is in the case of a boar. Um, so, you know, they all know each other and they're all pretty comfortable in the case of our sows right now. I think three of them are sisters and, and they've all been together. So even when we separate them, they're not really separated. Um, and I hope that's a, a helpful answer, a helpful non-answer. I believe I just gave. Um, so Sarah asks, how do you offset the cost of feeding year round if you only farrow one times a year? Um, I charge three times as much. <laughs> um, no, um, well, 
We're keeping four sows um, on average throughout the winter. Um, and we grow a lot for them. I mean, this is the truth. And a lot of those paddocks you saw, as we, um, as we wrap them up, we'll go back through and sow turnips and other fodder crops in there. Um, so, um, you know, that, and we do, I mean, we do get a, a little bit of a premium just based on the fact that we're raising these pigs in woods there in pasture and, um, you know, so we do get a little bit more, but it is um, often a, a point of discussion in our, our household finances um, when we're not doing it right. Um, uh, treatment for cockies. Some folks used Corid, but there are vitamin B absorption issues with that route. Um, I'm not the guy to ask that, Christy. Um, but I will, I'm gonna make a note right here to give you an answer. Um, I know it, you are correct that there are uh, absorption issues um, using corded, um, but again, we, you know, I just, I, I feel like every time I talk to a hog farmer, I feel spoiled because we don't have a lot of these, these challenges. And I think that that simply goes down to our, our pasture, management and the, the fact that our pigs are outdoors but um i'm happy to to dive deeper into that question for you christy and mike i just wanted to add to that um uh, that i i think with coccidia with it no matter if it's pigs or cows or you know calves or whatever it is the prevention or or you know chickens or whatever prevention is the best way to handle coccidiosis oh yeah don't don't let it happen to begin with and that's you know, that's what we've been, I don't want to say we're good at it. We've just been fortunate to, <laughs> to be in that situation. Um, do you find that boars fight each other? I have, I have to separate them. How about sibling songs, bickering or calm? Um, we typically will only have one boar at a time on farm. Um, if we do have, it's very rare that we'll have two. And on the occasion we do have two, we're either holding one for somebody else or, or something. Um, and in terms of our siblings, yeah, the siblings fight, but um, you know, it's not, uh, it, it's never been anything that's given us huge pause for concern. Um, how old for first breeding? Um, Christy, I, um, I, would, I would give you an answer of, you know, 12 to 13 months for us, but also it depends on the pig, right? I mean, the earlier we talked about the fallbacks and I said the two of my best sows are, are, are fallbacks, but they, you know, it, it was 18 months before I bred them. Um, if piglets are born in the middle of the night, is there a best way to ensure they stay warm if you, we can't dry them off? Um, yeah, um, and you, and you sort of answered that Michelle, right with this, it's going to be heat lamps and, uh, dry straw, um, make sure that the space is as clean and dry and warm as you can get it. Um, Christy also asks, do I back breed for select traits or always introduce new genetics? Um, no, I think we mostly, 99% of the time, we introduce new genetics. Um, and we do that in, in a number of ways with, with friends and, and other farmers that we work with. We'll, you know, I've, I've got a boar right now that just, I, I had two years ago that just came back to me for breeding this time. So, uh, but uh, now typically we, we're always trying to, in, introduce new genetics unless we find something specific that's got us excited. Uh, Mike, there's a couple of questions that relate to that in the chat. And I think you probably already answered Aaron's question. He's uh, he asked, can uh, a brother mate with a can you mate the brother and a sister? Would you suggest not doing that? I wouldn't suggest it. I mean um, and then the another question was from April, um, and she said, can it be too late to breed? We have two guinea hog gilts that are approaching two years old, but haven't been, and, but she hasn't bred them yet. Get on it. 
<laughs> yeah, go ahead. I don't think you can. I mean, yeah, they can get too old, but I mean, if they get too know, fat, that's what they get. Yeah, yeah, they might get too fat, but they're guinea hogs. Or um, you're looking for a boar, boy. I just some. Well, we won't get into that funny story, but I just had a whole mess of guinea hogs out in a, in a subdivision that um, were looking for new homes. <laughs> um, no, I'd say you're fine to breed them. Um, you know, you're going to want to watch them, right? Because they're sort of old gilts now. They're not like, I mean, they're, they're still a gilt, but they're they're older, but they shouldn't have any any challenges at all. And I'm sure you're going to love the guinea hogs. They're a fun a, a fun breed to raise. So we'll take these last two questions that came in in the um, in the Q and A, and then we'll wrap up. If that sounds good, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. We've already gone over a little bit, but we can always do another session with Mike, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, I got long winded. <laughs> no, now, it's all good. Advice for first timer, John. Have fun. Um, <laughs> you know. Um, I would say um, over plan and, and when you feel like you're overcompensating for a, a concern, you're probably right on track. Um, and don't, um, you know, don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, I think that's the, that's the biggest thing is don't, don't be scared to reach out to local farm, not scared, but you know, sometimes we just not great at asking for help. Um, at least I am. I don't, I don't mean to say that of you, John, but I never ask for help when I need it. And, and you know, that's the first piece of advice. Ask. Don't be scared to ask and don't be um, scared to, um, you know, to overplan, right? It, it, every problem you think you're going to have, you're going to have, and it's probably going to be twice as bad as you expect. So overcompensate, overplan, and have a good time. Pigs are fun animals. I mean, I, I really like our pigs. Um, they're a lot of fun. So um, do you promptly sell young boars as soon as they wean as feeders? Do you neuter any prior to sale? Um, that's a, that's a, a mixed answer, Christy. Um, we, um, we do, uh, if we have something that looks exceptional, we won't um, neuter it. Um, or if we have a, you know, a friend, like I said, we swap uh, genetics out with other farmers. So if we have someone that's interested in the, um, in the boar and, and feels that it would be uh, something they want, then we, we won't castrate. But typically uh, that happens at about 10, 10 days old. Awesome. Well, thank you, Mike, for we got to the whole list, I think, which is impressive. Um, let me just share my screen really quickly. Um, so before wrapping up, I just want to say thank you to everyone out there in the audience. They're still you're still with us today. Um, so a recording and this has come up a couple times folks are wondering where we're going to where you're when and where you're going to find the recording. I will be sending out an email later today with a link to the full recording, um, along with slides, um, a link to the slides. Everything will also be posted on FACS website and also on our um, our YouTube channel. So that will be there archived for you know your viewing pleasure going forward. Uh, quick plug for some other opportunities. Uh, we do have another great session coming up next week about grazing for resilience, bouncing forward from catastrophic events like flood and drought and all the things that are um, might be going on in different um, areas of the country. Um, also, a reminder that the application deadline for FACS Fund to Farmer Grants is tomorrow, uh, January 20th um, by midnight. So if you are thinking about applying, this is kind of the last chance to apply until we open the application period again in the fall. So I will be sure to send out links to the upcoming webinars and other opportunities in my follow up email. So on that note, I'm afraid that is all the time we have today. Sincere thank you to you, Mike. It's been an honor and a pleasure to have you with us. Lots of fun. And <laughs> we figured out all kinds of te technological things. Um, your presentation was really helpful. I think you know it was really great to have you answer 
um, and be so attentive to our audience questions. So thank you for that and spending the time and effort and energy to, to, to do to all that. Um, thank you to you, Samantha, for your help um, behind the scenes. Uh, and then everyone out in, your, in the audience, we've enjoyed having you with us. Thank you for being so attentive and um, and so interested in, in this really fascinating topic and, and taking the time to learn more about how to um, care for your animals. So I hope that you all have a really great rest of your day and that we're able to connect and um, be together again soon. So goodbye for now. Thanks everyone. Bye.